Hello and welcome to today's Cyber podcast. My name is Abigail Witt. I am a senior DSU uh, Dakota State University student and I am majoring in computer science. Hello, my name is Brianna McDaniel. I am a junior Dakota State University student and I am going or I am majoring in cyber operations. Here with us today is Nadia Kadim. Hi, Nadia. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate you uh, coming onto the podcast. We uh, drafted some questions for you, some about uh, your personal life and some about your career. So let's get started. Uh, Today here in South Dakota, it is uh, cold. It is very cold. We are getting flurries, actually. (laughs) It is starting to snow. Um, And I know you are across the ocean. Is that correct? Yeah, indeed. I am in Amsterdam. You're in Amsterdam. So you are a, a bit of a ways. We are currently at 8 a.m. here um, in South Dakota, but it is nighttime, right? Well, no, it's three o'clock actually, but I'm pretty much finishing up my day. So <laughs> it could, it might as well be nighttime for me. Can you give us a little background about yourself? Of course. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to meet you both, Abigail and Brianna. And I was so happy that you guys, um, you girls, asked me (laughs) to be on the podcast. Um, A little bit of background about me. I'm Dutch. Um, I'm based in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And I uh, started out life in a little town in the Netherlands. I won't bore you with the name because you won't know it anyway. But yeah, I had a I had an interesting start to life where um, yeah, I, I lived with my mom, my sister and my brother, but it was not always as easy as it could have been growing up. So I went to live with my grandmother when I was 14. And she always sort of um, yeah, tried to encourage me and my my sister, especially to to go to university so I was like okay I need to do this and what am I going to do and I felt really passionate about um, human rights and child rights in particular so I was like I'm going to study law um, but somehow I made my way into cybersecurity. Um, yeah now so I'm at the moment I started my own startup together with an amazing guy called Chris and uh, we're co-founders And I'm the CEO of now a company with four employees, which I never would have thought a few years ago. And uh, yeah, I guess that's what we're going to talk about today, about cybersecurity and uh, and all of that jazz. Yes, all of that jazz. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what's one thing we do not know about you? Uh, one thing that you do not know about me, unless you Google me, of course. I mean, have you Googled me or not? Well, uh, yeah. A little of research. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, what most people wouldn't necessarily expect when they talk about cybersecurity is that I'm also a singer. So my passion is really in music, um, especially jazz, which is maybe unconsciously why I just use that word as well. But um, jazz and soul and funk and performing and making music, it's really my passion. What is the coolest thing you've ever done? Oh, oh, wow. The coolest thing I've ever done. Um, I think that uh, a few years ago, there's this radio station here in the Netherlands. It's called Q Music. And it's, I don't know, what would it be sort of equivalent to? It's very, it's like one of the main three radio stations of the whole country. Do you have anything over there that's sort of similar? Um, what do you like to do in your downtime? So as a startup founder, um, there isn't a lot of downtime. Um, <laughs> which is not a recommendation for anyone wanting to go into cybersecurity. Don't become, you know, uh, a workaholic, but still it it, it can be quite busy. But if I do have some time, then I, well, I like to sing obviously, but I've talked enough about that already. Um, I love mixed martial arts. So that is like 
uh, a combination between jujitsu, kickboxing, all of that sort of stuff. So I like punching people in the face and <laughs> throwing them on the floor and <laughs> trying to choke them out. That's um, uh, one of my newfound uh, hobbies, I guess. <laughs> nice. And then you said you were a singer. So like, how did you find out like you became a singer? Like, how did you find out you liked singing? Um, well, ever since I was very young, I guess I, I always sang in the house. And then around, you know, the end of primary school. So I was about 10 or 11. We had this this musical at the end. So every Every single kid here in the Netherlands, I don't know if you guys do it too, but every single kid, if they finish school, your primary school, and before you go to high school, there's this musical that you do with your class. And this musical that we did was called Online. It was awful. It was a really bad musical, but I had the lead because I also really loved, you know, everything to do with sort of creative stuff. So I, I liked acting, I liked singing. And there was this song in the in the, in the musical which was like about cell phones and I mean you guys are a bit younger than me but this was like well I'm, I'm turning 28 on Monday so how old was I that's like 16 years ago or something 17 years ago a song about cell phones you know online um anyway I did that song and it was sort of a song that I did on my own without any other kids singing along with me so then all of the reactions were like oh my god you can really sing and I just guessed that that was sort of the moment where I realized oh can I oh well maybe I should do something with this so I started taking singing lessons and, and that's really how it started cool story uh we, have, <laughs> we don't have anything like that where we all have a musical at the end of oh, you should because it's fun. fun that does yeah we, we normally have like in high school uh i was a theater kid too uh so in high school we would uh have a, a spring musical and a fall music or a fall like play so that was kind of our going but it was kind of volunteer based on whoever yeah. likes theater can come yeah. and, and most of the music so most of the choir kids would would join in for the musical so oh, that's amazing yeah. yeah oh I always wish that we had sort of a more of a theater opportunity to do theater um when I was growing up but the musical was mandatory, so you could not get out of it. Oh, so no. Even if you hated it, you had to be a tree or whatever, or, or in this case, like a weird person who wanted to steal your thought through your mobile phone. It was really weird. But yeah, no, everyone had to join in. But I love theater, so it was good for what me. What makes you feel inspired or like your best self? Oh, what makes me feel inspired or like my best self? I love that question. Um, I feel inspired by people who are really sort of honest. And though I hate the word authentic, because it's one of those words that a lot of people like throw around to sound cool. Um, I like it when people are really themselves and when they're honest but also really assertive, especially women. Because for me, I I am not the most, I'm not not outgoing, but I'm not outgoing either. So when I started in the working life, one of my main jobs was to go out and give training and presentations to large group of, groups of people and stuff. And Obviously, I did the singing bit, and that was fine because I knew I can sing and I knew I like being on stage. But then you suddenly had to be a professional. And so I found that really hard. So something that inspires me is when people are like super assertive and confident, and especially women, because especially in cybersecurity, it's quite difficult to find other women who are you know, strong and, and, and tough, but nice and inspirational. And, and so that makes me really inspired. Nice. Um, and then what is your favorite place that you have traveled to? Ooh, my favorite place that I've traveled to is Australia. Um, 
I I know it's a big country. My favorite place within Australia um, was this this uh, well, it's in the middle of the country. It was this tiny, tiny, tiny town in the middle of sort of I wouldn't say the desert. They don't call it a desert. The outback is what they call it. And then there were just stars everywhere. I was camping like without a tent, so. Um, you could see the stars, but you were a little bit afraid of, of wit dingoes, like wild dogs coming to take your stuff. Um, so that was scary and cool at the same time. And I'm actually going to Miami on Tuesday. So it's my birthday on Monday. And for my birthday, I'm flying to Miami. Um, really so maybe great. that'll be my next favorite place. Yeah, I'm gonna nice. Yeah, my parents went to Australia. They, my dad uh, used to travel all around the world for work. And so they went to Australia and they had a lot of contacts in there. So they, my dad was like standing right next to a six, six foot, like al- or not an alligator, it was a lizard. Um, oh and God. then my mom, or he was like, you know, four wheeling. And then he's like, oh, yeah, well, did you see that poisonous snake back, snake back there? And my dad was like, <laughs> What? <laughs> like, oh my gosh! Tell me that. Like, yeah, it's one of the places. It's the things. scariest place in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so much fun because it's just like you travel like three miles into into the actual like yeah. country and you get no, there's nothing there's no exactly. civilization and it, it's surprising it's very it's, amazing. it's very drastic um it's even scary. here we're you know we're in the middle of nowhere a lot of times so it's just <laughs> like sometimes we kind of get that aspect as well so yeah oh amazing I remember being in that sort of area and you you've got their um Uluru so sometimes they call it um the red rock uh, the the big sort of flat red rock in the middle of the outback and and we went hiking a little bit behind there it's called King's Canyon and we were hiking and then I was at the edge and I remembered like I could look out for miles and I don't know if you know about the Netherlands but it's one of the most congested countries in the world I think there's a few countries that are worse but in terms of houses and there's no nowhere really where you have such an open view and and I've always loved that like and I imagine that you love it hopefully you love it too about the U.S. because you do have sort of those great plains and those open spaces. Yeah we just have to drive uh, I think four and a half hours to go to our uh now our Black Hills um in the Rocky Mountains and uh Mm. So, and my, my family travels out there all the time. Oh, amazing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your country or your, your company? Sorry. My company. Uh, yeah. So my company is called Nax Cyber. Um, we have built an application to help small businesses. Um, even if it's like a one person business to a 300 person business, we help them, um, to become cyber secure and GDPR compliant. So the GDPR is a European law that is all about data protection and cyber security is obviously all about data protection. So it links in really well. And so, yeah, we've been building this app for a year now and tomorrow it's gonna go live. So I'm terrified, <laughs> but we're testing it now. And and this is the second release, I must say, but the second release was much cooler than the first release. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to, to wear a black turtleneck tomorrow and just do a presentation about it. Um, I love Steve Jobs, I'm not going to. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. And uh, yeah, we're really starting off. So we, we've been going now since September of last year. So it's a little over a year and we've done so many things that I never thought I would do. Um, and we've helped a lot of people, which is cool as well. That's great. Yeah, it's um, very um, interesting. So I see that on LinkedIn, you have a master's degree in public and international law. What was your inspiration in pursuing a law degree and how did that help you get your current job? So I remember it very, very distinctly. Um, after high school, I didn't go. I, uh, so in the Netherlands, you've got three levels of high school. You've got the first level, the second level, and the third level. And with the second level, you can go to college. 
which is often more um, like management jobs and stuff, more hands-on, I guess. And then with the top level, you can go to university, then you can become a lawyer, a judge, a doctor, a psychologist, whatever, psychiatrist, you can do medicine and stuff. So I did the middle level um, and I, I went to college and I did international tourism management. And I was just like, hmm, this is not really for me. I don't know what it is. I love traveling. I loved helping people. I loved speaking other languages. So I was like, this is a good fit. But then in practice, it wasn't. With that year, I got this sort of intermediate diploma that I could go to university with. And I was thinking, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go like become something else. But what? So one afternoon in the summer vacation, it was like right before... I had to sort of enroll into uni. I still hadn't decided. And, and I, I made my mind up about either psychology or law. And I was watching a documentary about Guantanamo Bay, um, and uh, which is obviously horrible. So in that documentary, I could see how these, these people, often from Iraq or Afghanistan or all of those sort of countries um, were detained without a trial. They were tortured and questioned. And I was like, no, I, I can't, like, I cannot let this go. So I decided I'm gonna study law. And then when I grow up, <laughs> I'm gonna go work for a human rights organization. Well, I did study law and during my university, I started becoming really interested in international law, uh, which is like the law of um, treaties between countries and the law of war, like what can you do when there's a conflict and stuff like that. So it had nothing to do with privacy or cybersecurity. Then I also love children's rights. So I, I, I specialize in children's rights, children's rights a little bit. Then I was working as a freelancer for years, um, giving presentations about children's rights and stuff like that. And then one of these companies that I'd been doing that for, for a couple of years, asked me like, hey, Nadia, you are almost done with your degree, aren't you? Do you want a job with us? And I was like, yeah, that'd be good. Then I don't have to worry, you know, and then I'm not going to be one of those, <laughs> one of those people who's unemployed for a while after uni, because there were many um especially with international law degrees so um and then at that company the gdpr that law that i was talking about the data protection law in europe just came into force or was just going to come into force and they needed someone to tell them what to do basically like what is this law state what do we need to do just help us just just do it um, and i was the only sort of legal person on staff so that became my responsibility and um, that's really how I got into privacy and then cybersecurity because privacy and cybersecurity are obviously two sides of the same coin. So from law to children's rights, to my job, to the GDPR, to this business is really how I got where I am today. How does being a children's right and international humanity humanitarian law expert help be being CEO of uh, your, your company? So when you do law, it's not necessarily about, you know, learning all of the different rules by heart. It's really about reading and thinking in a certain way. When I was in high school, I always thought um, with maths, for instance, like how is this going to help me with anything if I need to know how to calculate a triangle or prove that something is a triangle? Like, how is that going to help me? That was all about training you to think in a certain way. And it was the same thing with law. It helped me read in a certain way, read to see the details and to sort of link different elements in a text together or different documents or different rules or different situations. So it just helped me to sort of see the connections. And now as a CEO, I have to think about everything. Some days I'm just doing meetings, um, but sometimes I have to come up with a strategy for the next five years. And sometimes I need to make sure that this small task is done, but then I also have to make sure that it fits within the whole project plan that it's actually on track and that we're going to reach that five-year plan. So it's all very strategic and you, you have to be able to take sort of a step back 
um, but also go into the details. And I think that's what law, doing a law degree really helped me with is as a lawyer, we're very nitty gritty, like we're nitpicky and details. Um, but then if you want to win a case, for instance, you have to look at all of the different laws all of the different judge rulings and then somehow link those together to see if you can make your case right so i feel like that's really uh, been really helpful to me to sort of train my mind in a certain way that is a uh, very interesting um i noticed that you speak uh different languages like multiple languages um, which are dutch english french and german how has that helped you in your career um, well, so my, well, I am Dutch, so my, my sort of my native tongue is Dutch, uh, but as I'm speaking here with you today, it's all in English. My, my business partner, Chris, is, is British, so he speaks English and his Dutch is not very good. Yeah, don't tell him. <laughs> um, um, it has allowed me to do business in different languages with different people, making everybody still feel very comfortable, I guess, and um, it's allowed us to have sort of two target markets. So we're selling in the Netherlands, but we're also selling in the UK and maybe someday in the US, although it's a very big country. So we'll wait a little bit longer. And speaking, you know, speaking those other languages, it just helps you connect with people. And that's really the basis of doing business is, is having relationships with people and creating harmony, making everybody feel comfortable than to do business. So I think speaking different languages really helps there. What is your favorite time of day and why? Huh. Definitely not the evening. Um, so it's either the morning or the after, but it's also not really the morning. Um, <laughs> so I guess it's the afternoon. It's, I, I don't know. It's between, kind of. It's in between. Do you know that there's this thing, like, I, I, I always think about this. There's this meme I saw once that said, I'm not a morning, um, but we have, it, we have it with birds, actually. So maybe it doesn't work in English. But when you, you like getting up in the morning, we call you an early bird. Yep. Um. But when you like to be out all night, we call you a night owl. And if you don't, are if you aren't like either of them, you're just a permanently exhausted pigeon. <laughs> I feel like that permanently exhausted pigeon. <laughs> no, that's definitely not not completely true. But I, I have not heard of that. Um. <laughs> I really like that one. <laughs> I don't know when it's winter like here at the moment it's getting dark around 5 30 in the afternoon and then it's like pitch black and I really hate the dark I I that just really makes me really sad I don't like dark so so that's why I guess it's the morning or the afternoon <laughs> um how does or how does a typical day of work look like a typical day of work for me starts uh, in my bed where I'm like, oh, I should have gotten up, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> then I might get my phone and check my email, but I usually you know, get up around 7, 7.30 and then start work by 8. First, I read my emails and answer the things that I really need to answer need the things I should have answered yesterday so I'm doing it at eight and then um I either work from home or I go to our office I'm now at the office we have a co-working space so it's not our office but it's we have a nice little area within the building then I make coffee and I just you know I have loads of meetings um and I do a lot of calls with customers or with partners or with investors and then the rest of my time is basically um, either doing um, financials so I try to make a financial plan and I need to make sure that all of you know all the invoices are paid and all of the and we are getting paid and all of that sort of thing is in order 
I make legal documents for our customers. And I actually really love that because that's the time where I put in my earbuds, put on some nice music and just do a legal document where I don't have to really think that much. And, um, and other than that, I try to do um, some sports, but I usually fail. So I, I, so I told you about the mixed martial arts thing. I went like four times a week for about six months and then I injured myself. Oh, no. um, so I was told by the physiotherapist not to go anymore for a while. So right now I'm on a sabbatical from MMA and I'm going to Zumba tonight, which is where you like shake your booty and your dance. It's like, it couldn't be more different. But um, yeah, I try to do, I try to go to the gym and get a little bit of physical exercise, but most days I fail. I like stop working around seven or eight and then have dinner and then usually watch some Netflix and go to bed. How do you balance your life and work? Well, that's a great question because you should definitely balance your life and work. Um, but I think at the moment I'm not succeeding yet. So, you know, for me, I, I wake up and I go to bed with work in my head. And that's that's the thing that's tiring. And that's the thing that's going to burn you out. So you really need to make sure that you have some form of relaxation, which is why going to the gym is good. And it's something that I did. That's why I went like four times a week. Um, and I need to get back into it. Um, maybe Zumba will be my next thing. But I think having some physical exercise and just even if it's an hour a day where, you, where you're where you forced not to think about work to then sort of make that demarcation of your workday being over, I think that is really important. And, and continue doing fun things with your friends or with your partner. Um, I, um, I think that's really about about time making time for it but by making time for it you're also balancing it out and you're sort of resetting your mind having that time to relax and to sort of unwind so yeah don't take my example um do all those things i just said that i definitely don't do but i'm trying <laughs> yeah definitely um so how did you see yourself going into cyber or did you ever see yourself going into cybersecurity and how did you find your career path into cybersecurity so i never ever thought that i would be a woman in cyber um to be fair like it wasn't such a hot thing um 10 years ago when when I was in high school, no, it's not 10 years ago, is it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and so going into university and stuff, I never really thought about, about um, the possibility of going into cyber. Um, privacy always seemed very boring to me, like one of the most boring topics. I did do a little bit of privacy at, at university, some courses on it, and it was just super boring. But so I kind of rolled into it and I kind of um, stumbled into it. and. Um, yeah, that's not to say that I don't love it because I do. Um, but I, yeah, never really saw myself going in there, which is why it's super, why it's so good, why it's amazing that you guys are doing this podcast because especially girls and, and women and yeah, we just don't really see this as an option often. It's a, it's a strange field too. Like we're a strange bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and though, you know, a lot of people think cyber, uh, they see these, these people in hoodies and, 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 ha and they all only think about hacking and stuff, but it's, it can be so much more and it can be so many other things. And um, like for me, for our company, for instance, we're, because because I am who I am, and then and Chris is is my my partner, my business partner, and my life partner. Um, we were like, okay, what do we want to do? And, and we want to be different. And cyber is very male dominated, masculine. Even the language is is masculine, like attacks and 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 all of that sort of stuff. And then again, the men in hoodies on all of the pictures. So we we sort of consciously came to this idea of our brand being more feminine, being really helpful and maternal almost and nurturing nurturing the relationship with our customers and protecting them 
And cybersecurity is all about protecting, right? So I think it should actually be if like much more female in that field, in that sense, but we're getting there with things like what you're doing now. What is your biggest challenge in your career? Oh, I know what I want to say, but I don't want to sound cliched. But I guess, I guess <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> it's so, so when I started, like I said, we started about September time last year. And I was, I, we went in, we were accepted onto a cybersecurity accelerator program in the UK with the National Cybersecurity Center. And we were one of five startups that were at that time part of that year's sort of cohort, as they call it, um, to do this accelerator program. But I, um, yeah, I found myself to be um, often the only woman in the room. But that wasn't even the biggest problem. The, the problem, is that people don't realize that they can be sort of sexist in their everyday behavior and their everyday comments. So, you know, there's so many examples I can mention, but, but the main thing is that as a woman, you still have a lot to prove. And even yesterday, I was speaking to this investor, a Dutch guy, and, uh, and he meant well, like I know he didn't mean it maliciously, but what he said is like, yeah, I like your company. I stumbled across it. That's why I reached out. Thank you for meeting with me. And, you know, uh, yeah, one of the reasons that I'm interested is because, well, you, you've got a cool company, but also it's a female co-founder. You don't see that very often. And and most investors are a little bit scared to invest in, in female-run companies. And I was like, what? Why? This is absolutely ridiculous. But I realize that it's true. There's still such a an imbalance and uh, people lean towards guys especially in cyber because it's all about computers and women don't understand the computers right so that's one of the biggest challenges to go into a room to be taken seriously as a, a professional woman and as the ceo that they don't go to chris and go like yeah but you're the boss right like um, that, you know, I actually do make decisions and that I actually do have valid opinions. And I think um, that's really going to change in the next years, hopefully, because I think as sort of the older generation, to put it very unkindly, dies off, um, like those sort of old and outdated views hopefully will die off with them. <laughs> um, I'm not wishing death upon anyone but I'm just saying that they're usually older guys um I hope that that's going to change this yeah definitely I know like from my experience like when people were asking oh what are you going to college for I would say cybersecurity, and then they'd be shocked and be like well you're going into a great field and it's like definitely um yeah, so exactly. I totally yeah I totally understand about you know females like it's not common for them to be in the career field exactly yeah, the whole the whole the whole speech of oh you're going into the great field I hear that every time I talk about it that's the one thing that always is repeated it's oh it's a great field that's I'm like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm going into it like yeah it's probably because a lot of people don't really understand it and if you say cybersecurity, they have no idea what to imagine like if you say I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be a doctor, then people know what it is like. But cybersecurity, I mean, it is a lot of things. So uh, so I understand that they don't quite understand. So they have to come with such a general comment, like, good for you. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then what is your biggest career achievement to date? I think just in general, starting this business and running this business, and it seems to be going well. So I feel incredibly, I wouldn't say proud because I'm, I'm not, you know, not comfortable enough to say I'm proud of myself, but I'm proud of what we've done. Like Chris and I, and then our team since July, we hired our first people and, and the team of developers that we've got, they're just an amazing bunch of people. And I'm just sort of surprised every day that this is my life now, that I can 
I have the freedom to to do what I want and how I think it's best. I don't have to report to anyone. Uh, it's crazy to me. I never expected it. Who has been your support system throughout your career? Throughout my whole career, it was... Um, <laughs> Again, one of those questions. Why do I not have the answers ready? Um, yeah, so my my boyfriend a partner, Chris, um, you know, we started this company together. So, you know, throughout starting NAC, um, quitting our jobs, um, facing not getting a deal come through or facing rejection from investors or stuff like that having him there like we're really an equal team and that's an amazing thing to have um so i would say that since we started NAC, he's really been my support system and before that at my previous job um it wasn't really any sort of family but that company that i worked for was almost a family so it was it was it was very supportive and and very nice and it was like um yeah, like if I ever had any concerns, I wouldn't go to someone else. I would just go straight, you know, to my boss and to, to my manager and stuff. So so that was really nice. And and um, yeah, since we started NAC, it's definitely been Chris, who is like the co-founder. So it, it makes sense that we sort of support each other in that. That's awesome that you have like an awesome support system. Makes your job so much easier. Yeah, um, exactly. And so, Yeah. Um, what is your favorite part about your job? The favorite part of my job is to talk to people, whether it's customers or partners or not really investors. Like that's that's one of my least favorite things. But um, talking to those people and then sort of explaining them, explaining to me what they worry about and what what they would need help with. And then sort of the feeling that, hey, I've got something that can help you. Listening to them, really making sure that it's the right fit. And um, so you you know those, um, those personality tests where you can sort of fill out questionnaires and then it sort of tells you what color you are. And um, green is very relationship oriented and harmonious. Yellow is where you're very creative and full of ideas red is like you go and you do and you don't really think that much but you just do blue is being very organized and I'm probably missing a few but I'm very green I'm very much about relationships and harmony and making everybody get along and and making sure that everybody feels comfortable but that's sort of that's really good to have if if you've got a people facing job and I do so I love talking to people and growing those relationships and helping where I can yeah, that, and that's something that inspires me every day. And that's really why, what gives me energy as well. What is the biggest thing you've learned in your cybersecurity career? I know it's been short, but what is the biggest <laughs> thing you've learned? The biggest thing I've learned in my cybersecurity career is a lot of technical stuff like a lot before that I didn't know anything about anything really apart from the law so um that's 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 been amazing but um if you talk about it from a more sort of business perspective or even a personal perspective then I am learning how to be assertive how to you know come like stand up for myself and for my business and for the interests of my business without being afraid that people won't like me or having the the, uh, having that feeling like I need to speak very softly and very sweetly and very highly because then they'll like me um genuinely that has been one of the biggest changes because I had a coach who who said um yeah you've got this great product you've got this great company you're a great person but you just need to stand there and own it and 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 be confident and and he talked to me about my voice and and things like that and I learned that the way you present yourself is so important um 
to be taken seriously and to get further in your career. But then at some point, if you act like it, you'll also feel like it. So it doesn't feel like a facade at all. It just it feels like I've sort of come into my own. I've grown into my own skin. So those are sort of the most, the biggest changes since I started, I guess. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely like important to be confident, stand up for yourself. Um, yeah, it's especially like as a female and in cybersecurity. Exactly. Um, yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. So where do you see your career going from here? Um, well, in about five years, we will sell the business. Um, so but in in the next years there will be a lot that's happening so I will have to manage a lot more people than I do now I will probably hire people to help me do that actually <laughs> um, I will I'm thinking about getting a cybersecurity certification uh, because I don't have a cybersecurity certification so just I kind of want to challenge myself and test my knowledge um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll have to have strategic partnerships and, and then talks with more investors. And um, I think that will be my life for the next five years, getting a cybersecurity certification. And then after we sell the business, who knows? I don't think I will uh, necessarily start another business, but I do think I will sort of stay in this field. So as a consultant or as... Um, yeah, as a cybersecurity specialist for the government or something like that. And that's really what I'd love to do. But first, after we sell uh, sell the business, I'll, I'll think I'll think about what I want and sort of make good conscious decisions and um, yeah, see where the next sort of years, five years, I guess, take me. What is the best piece of advice you've been given? best piece of advice I've been given don't compare your inside to someone else's outside so I heard this and I was like oh my god I wish I heard that 10 years ago as a woman again but men do this too uh, people do this but uh, it's very easy to compare your feelings of inadequacy and imposter syndrome and lack of knowledge and being like not good enough to someone else's confident amazing i can do anything facade and that's exactly what i've been doing ever since i started comparing myself to other people firstly don't compare yourself to other people but if you do don't compare your your inside to someone else's outside because it just makes you insecure and it makes you feel inadequate but you don't know what other people are dealing with even and, and people can lie very well it, like they can they can put up this sort of theatrics um this little play this little show of how well it's going and how little effort they have to put into anything and it's just not true so everyone struggles with with some insecurities with some issues whether it's actual lack of knowledge whether it's i don't know something else something with their family something with their life in general um just always remember that everybody has those and that you are yourself and that you're on the right path and that you're you know good as you are and i think that's for everyone like not necessarily in cybersecurity, not necessarily people running their own business. It's every single one I know. Like every every time I, I heard imposter syndrome a few years ago, I was like, what is that? I was like, that's not a thing. But it is like now I've started to realize that it's definitely a thing. That is uh, some interesting and good advice. And then what is your advice to people who want to help women going into cybersecurity? My advice for people wanting to get more women into cybersecurity is doing exactly what we're doing now. Go on podcasts or start your own podcast if you have the time. Um, I think it starts very early. I think it should start very early. It should start in schools because by the time you are 
at university or you're already working, you've already chosen a career. You can, of course, do another course or another degree and get, then go into cybersecurity, but it'd be good to sort of show children, young people, that this is a career option, whoever they are, whatever they are. Um, so I think go to schools, go to events, talk to people, talk to young people. And, and yeah, keep, keep talking about how cool of an industry it is and that, that we need more women in there. And so I love this podcast. I've been on a few of like different, super amazing people and women. And I think it's just good to keep lifting each other up and making sure that it's sort of an inclusive place for people to go and um, that they don't feel that they don't belong here. So our last question, do you have any advice for young girls who might be pursuing a career in cybersecurity? Advice for young girls that want to go into cybersecurity? Well, probably they're listening to this podcast, hopefully. <laughs> so, so I would say listen to this one and maybe try to find some other ones um, and, and realize that there's a lot of different things you can do in cybersecurity. So think about what you're good at already and then apply that to the sector. Don't try to fit yourself to what you think. So if you think cybersecurity is hacking um, and but but you you're not very you're not very good at I don't know computers in general or whatever, you don't necessarily have to become something is all I'm saying. And I think there's so many opportunities in the sector to do so many different things. It can be more on the governance and organizational side, or it can be very technical. You can go into training or teaching or building a product. You can do anything you want. So, so or in like have a little look around, see what's out there, and then see what you're already good at, and then try to apply that to any job in, in cybersecurity, if that makes sense. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Nadia, for coming on our podcast. Uh, we no love having you. Uh, you gave some really good advice and some really good talking points, and it's been lovely to meet you. Likewise. Um, thank you. So for our social media, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and here on YouTube. You can check out our other podcasts. And we also have Cyber Conversations every Wednesday at 4 Central Time. Um, and thank you so much for, for watching. Thank you both.